one of the darkest spirits to attack the presence of the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ has become so prevalent. And what's concerning is many who have no idea, they think they're saved and that they're full of the Holy Spirit, but they possess a false Holy Spirit and they do not know that. I've witnessed the true anointing of the Holy Spirit, but we are too frequently seeing a different spirit when we pray with people and it mimics the Holy Spirit. The spirit will even face to face with us start speaking in tongues to us. And those who have this spirit are generally churched. They have a strong spirituality by their own definition and they just have something that's bothering them, some issue they want to be healed from or delivered from, but they don't diagnose themselves as having any big spiritual issue. The common trait usually is that they diagnose themselves by how they feel, but they're shocked in the end to find out that a false guiding spirit is in them, a demon, and they feel like a different person when it's gone. We have to be willing to throw out our desire for genuine spiritual experiences and lock on to the truth. Many experiences in the church are certainly real, but in many cases, in people that we are having come to us for help, they are ending up demonized because they join into these experiences. And this could be why revival doesn't come. The Holy Spirit is maybe grieved and waiting for people to repent because they prefer feelings over the truth. Followers of Jesus are called to obey and fulfill the word of God and to depend completely upon the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to transform their life. But Satan is delighted when the professing believer will use all of his methods to accomplish the same thing instead. Satan knows we're spiritual be beings and that all that which relates to our will and our emotions is also going to affect our spirit. It is critical that every activity related to the church be totally biblical and not mixed with add-ins from the devil. If that is the case, then you need to run from this relevant approach to biblical interpretation. And they do call it re relevant, culturally relevant. Our efforts to be relevant with worldly thinking have nearly destroyed many Christian ministries, many Christian colleges, and a lot of churches. There is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. The Bible commands believers to test every spirit, but many Christians want and experience too much to actually follow that command. Many sitting in our churches want to feel a move of God, a move of the Spirit. So they do not walk by faith, but by sight. So it's very easy for deceiving devils to enter into the church and into these people. The Holy Spirit is sovereign. He will manifest himself only when he can act sovereignly and in full agreement with the Word of God. That is the only time. The Holy Spirit does not glorify himself, and he acts only to exalt Jesus Christ. It's easy to see that something is wrong when we expect the Holy Spirit to show up to give human goosebumps, crazy energy, and zero focus on self-denial and showing reverence for the King of Kings. That's the only way the Holy Spirit is going to show up. The false spirits of lying spirits, antichrist spirit, um, and spirits of deception have taken over much of the American church. Second Peter 2 1 says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. First John 4 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, 
and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Depart from the faith, meaning they were in the faith. You can't depart from it if you were not in it by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Matthew 24, 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as selves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. Jeremiah 14, 14, And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. Matthew 24, 24, the false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead, if possible, even the elect astray. Bill Randalls wrote about his visit to a revival in his book, Weighed and Found Wanting. Here's his description of what he experienced in a church, a charismatic Pentecostal church that was claiming revival. Spiritual drunkenness seemed to be the predominant manifestation. After the invocation, come Holy Spirit, the wide open congregation began to stagger and sway. Loud ruckus laughter rolled over portions of the congregation like a wave. I was deeply concerned about one young family I met. It seems that they had been one of the founding families of a church in Ohio, but they had grown disillusioned and left. Now they had found it and were ready to take it back with them to their church in Ohio. Such a lovely family who obviously had come to the Lord and served him. They were shocked that night after I told them, I don't buy it. I asked the dad, don't you have any reservations at all coming into this wave? He emphatically replied, no way, this is God. Two years of not feeling God is long enough. At this point in the service, the drunkenness had taken over the entire congregation. People were stumbling and falling all over each other by the dozens. Most were flat on their backs with a silly dazed grin on their faces or trying to get up and were unable to. One man was yelling at the top of his voice, another lying on the ground, feet straight up in the air, laughing and trying to get his feet down. The ministry team was going around swishing the wave on people getting intoxicated themselves. I suppose in one sense this was fun to them. It reminded me of my old days, high school kegger parties, only wilder yet. The whole time this is going on, the young man from Ohio is telling me, this is God. His eyes were bloodshot. He is swaying as he stands there, and he's breathing heavily, about to fall over. That is a church that has been taken over by the devil. He didn't steal it. It was handed to him. And that can be done by the pastor himself allowing in seducing spirits. I would say it comes more easily by the music team. You need to know the faith lifestyle of your worship leaders. They need to be fully serving and surrender to Jesus. They need to be walking in purity. They need to be walking as they're probably the most, the person you should be most concerned about as being aligned with Christ. If not, and they were chosen by their gifting, which is what often happens, and they were given approval through a choice of gifting over their obedience, this is a wide open door for the devil to move into your church. I experienced this a few times after I was born again. I was um, serving in a Youth for Christ in the area, and through that ministry, I experienced a few additional things. I had come from probably at least six steady years in nightclubs almost every, every night. And at that point, the videos had come out, and it was just a loud, crazy scene in these clubs. And I was really confused by the music right away when I was a Christian. I was confused 
because I felt like I can't tell the difference between this music and the music I just left. And then when I started to see some of the performers, I was even more confused. They were seductive. They acted like the rock bands. They would even wear the really tight pants. They would have their shirts unbuttoned just like the world. And I asked someone, how is this Christian band any different than the world? And their answer was, there are different styles for everyone. People have different music preferences. I said, I, I don't like this. This is too much of what I just left. And they said, don't judge. So several years later, that very band that I was concerned about broke up and their lifestyles were exposed for everyone to see. They were definitely not followers of Jesus. They were very much of the world in every way. Fame and fortune were their God. They couldn't find it in the, in the secular world because they weren't good enough. So they had crossed over into the Christian and I found out that's actually not that unusual. But I also learned quickly, you can't ask any questions because you will be guilty of a greater sin called judging. I learned that very fast. But if people read the Bible, you would see that we are called to judge the fruit of those in the church. In fact, I just read 1 Corinthians 5 this past week and I was so startled by what it said that I sent it to the girls here because I thought, how do people read this? How do they get around this? Because I'm going to read you the chapter. It's not that long. 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put him out of your fellowship, the man who has been doing this? For my, for my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may now have a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside, but expel the wicked person from among you. That answers the don't judge question very clearly. We are to be judging those in the church. The devil's primary method is to imitate what is real. There's a great difference in the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the devil. Satan comes by titillating the flesh. He despises the use of one's mind, and he does not want us leaning on the basis of faith and truth. He wants us all stuck on feeling, adrenaline, excitement. That's how he wants us to make choices, pick things that we do, evaluate what is of the Holy Spirit even. And this is also one of the main open doors to error and false doctrine. The Holy Spirit speaks to man's spirit, not his flesh, and always according to the word of God. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You might be able to get someone's attention by something they feel or see, but you will not bring them to Christ that way. A person is brought to Jesus Christ only by the work of the Holy Spirit and through the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that no man can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 44. 
the use of flesh and emotion in an effort to stimulate and then by that stimulation draw others to God is completely false and it's a false gospel. The Bible warns us, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1.8. American Christians want to experience God by experiences. More and more in today's church, we're finding church leaders willing to experiment with even new methods of prayer. Complative prayer, contemplative prayer is a prayer discipline made up of many different mantras. The purpose of this prayer is to enter an altered state of consciousness in order to find one's true self, thus finding God. And those who practice this form of prayer essentially say that all paths lead to God. Ministry leaders are so caught up in this new thing desire that they're willing to try anything in order to become appealing and also appeasing to the unsaved crowd. Thomas Merton, who is one who completely supports this contemplative consciousness, is a, says it's a transcultural, transreligious, transformed consciousness. It can shine through this or that system, religious or irre irreligious. In A Quiet Revolution, it's said that sparked by Eastern meditation techniques, today's version of centering prayer is bent on stilling the mind. This prayer is dangerous. True followers of Jesus should not bring any form of this Eastern meditation into their lives. Only church leaders are teaching this heresy to the very people who are called to the people who are actually supposed to protect us are the ones that are bringing this into the church. And you should run from them because they are listening to a demon. There's many counterfeit spirits. The Bible speaks of evil spirits, false spirits, lying spirits, among many others. And there are several reasons why these devils are entering the churches. People who feel far from God continue to seek more spiritual experiences and then they fall into dangerous demonic deception, such as this perverted biblical style of prayer. It is no different in practice than meditation by Eastern religions. The counterfeit church and its feel-good gospel has taken over so many churches. The awe and the holiness of the Word of God has passed in many Many believers still love the word, share the gospel, and pray for each other, but most have chosen another way. They want a secular form of worship. They want freedom to interpret the Bible according to their own preferences, which would certainly cut out the chapter I just read, because they don't want that kind of thing in the Bible. So they, they, they read the things they want to agree with, and then they forget about the rest of it. So there's a gap in separating the truth from the world's more seeker-friendly versions. We've got this great divide now where you've got those who genuinely stay in the word, share the true gospel, which are few. There's very few. I said last week about um, altar sinners prayers. Don't even mention the cross, the need to deny self going forward, that you have to leave your sin for salvation to even take hold. They don't say that at all. People don't even tell them that in most churches. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, spoke of the deadness of churches in his generation. In one of his books, he wrote, because the love of many, almost all so-called Christians, has waxed cold, that is the real cause why the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit are no longer to be found in the Christian church. Philip Brown speaks on the Holy Spirit versus what's called the Kundalini Spirit. This is the spirit we often find that is the false spirit guide mimicking the Holy Spirit in people. He says, how can we distinguish between the anointing of the Holy Spirit and counterfeit manifestations? Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Jesus said, many false prophets will arise and lead many astray in Matthew 24, 11. Jesus even foretold that false Christ's anointed ones and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, if possible, to lead even the elect astray. The greatest counterfeiter will be the false prophet of Revelation who performs great signs 
even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people and by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast it deceives those who dwell on earth this is all in revelation 13 and since there are counterfeits and counterfeiters how do we avoid deception there's a great deal of confusion about the anointing of the holy spirit some use the phrase for a special sense of divine empowerment experienced by a preacher or his audience on this view conviction of sin righteousness and judgment to come determines whether the preacher is anointed or not others use it for the spirit's power which can be tapped into for healing blessing personal flourishing on this view health wealth and prosperity are marks of the anointing others associate it with speaking in tongues or with the ability to do signs and wonders others with activities such as shouting running in the aisles getting blessed falling down completely under the spirit but to be honest the bible doesn't use any of these as an indicator of the anointing the noun anointing occurs in only two new testament verses first john 2 20 and first john 2 27 the king james version translated it unction in verse 20 but shifted to anointing in verse 27. Modern English versions translate it as anointing in both versions. 1 John 2.27 is probably the key New Testament text on this topic. John writes, But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need that any, anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true, and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. So, perhaps there's such confusion because the anointing sounds impersonal or experiential. But if we read the Bible carefully and comprehensively, we see that the anointing of the Holy Spirit actually means the anointing which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. The anointing does two things that support this. First, the anointing abides in us. John says that we know that Jesus abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. 1 John 3, 24. Also Romans 8, 9, and 11. Paul says that believers are anointed with the Spirit who seals us and lives within us as a pledge of our inheritance. 2 Corinthians 1, 21, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. Second, the anointing teaches us. According to 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13, we have not we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from god that we might understand the things freely given us by god and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom but by the spirit in other words the spirit who abides in us teaches us to understand what god has revealed in his word first corinthians 2 9 through 10 the anointing that abides in us and teaches us is the holy spirit Once we know that the Spirit is the anointing, we can apply what the Bible says about the Spirit to discern what is actually false. And by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. 1 John 4, 2-3, also 2 John 1, 7. False prophets are known by their fruits, just like genuine prophets, false prophets, will always show up by their fruit they do not obey the bible and they do not have the anointing of the holy spirit how can we avoid being deceived there are two keys to avoid deception first you must know god's word and if you do not know what god has said you will be deceived jesus gives the second key in john where he tells the jews if anyone is willing to do his will He will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. John 7, 17. In other words, if we want to know whether something is truly from God or not, we must first be willing to do the will of God. We can know that we're willing to do his will if we currently are doing what God has asked us to do. That's how we will know. If we're not walking in the light that God has already given us, then we're obviously not willing to do his will, then you will likely not know the truth. And that is a fearful position to be in, for it opens you up to the enemy's deception and actually demonic possession. Stay in the word, walk in the light, 
and you will not have to worry about being deceived. Many who come to us for prayer, when we ask them, are you in the word? How are you in the word? How often are you in the word? will admit they're not in the word. They will just say, I'm, I, there's many reasons why. We actually can't fix that. So if they aren't going to proceed to become people of the word, there's really no way for them to stay free because there's just no other way to do it. They're easy prey for the devil. Kundalini, which is coiled one, in Hinduism refers to a form of divine energy said to be located at the base of the spine. And what's interesting is in prayer ministry, when that is um, discerned or when you know it's there, that's exactly where they will feel it, is in their lower back. It was seen as a force or power associated with the divine feminine, which when cultivated and awakened through tantric practice could lead to spiritual liberation. Kundalini is associated with other forms of Hinduism as well as modern spirituality and New Age and very much present in the Christian church. When there is a consistent theme of power, anointing, and the Holy Spirit present in revivals, the overwhelming results are conviction of sin and surrender to biblical holiness. Many times conviction was so strong that the sinners could not stand on their feet. They would grip onto poles or furniture they could not stand they would fall on their faces in repentance and reverent fear before the god of holiness and the god that would judge them some writers have pointed out that people fell down under the power of god during many previous revivals they fell under the most piercing sorrow and conviction of sin they fell down under the preaching of edwards whitfield wesley and finney because they could not stand under the weight of their own sin for even one moment longer they fell as thunderstruck by the awesome holiness of the living God. The overriding theme of genuine revival down the centuries has been tremendous conviction of sin and then deep repentance and then a pursuit of holiness and purity. The Kundalini spirit, the one that also produces what appears to be revivals, is called falling out in the spirit, holy laughter, wild jerking and body gyration that is so dominant in many churches there's very little question that the bible says this is a false religion there are accounts of worship where david danced before the lord and the healed man in acts was walking leaping and praising they will point this out to you but these were always in reverent great awe of the lord in the bible they were not looking for material blessing. They were crying out to a holy God. There's a difference between self-centered and God-centered activity. One is easily created by hypnotic methods and mass hysteria, while the other is usually related to hunger and thirst for God. I was watching a documentary this, this weekend, actually, on how things happened for a current television minister he holds big healing crusades and they showed people from the inside showed how he studies hypnosis and he knows that if you repeat a line of a music course over and over and over it becomes like chanting and you lull everyone into a trance like state that allows you to control them with hand movements he can go like this and a bunch of people will fall down this is definitely using the work of the enemy and can easily lead to demonic possession of those who are participating in this. Robert Wilmer speaks of seven signs of the Holy Spirit versus the Kundalini Spirit. And these are Christians talking about the Kundalini Spirit and the deception that is going on in the churches. And this is a problem within many churches. But there is a difference between the actual Holy Spirit and the Kundalini Spirit. And here are seven of them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit will always be brought about through the Word of God and praise of Jesus Christ. The Kundalini Spirit just happens. Two, the baptism of the Holy Spirit never leaves you out of control while the Kundalini Spirit takes you out of control. 
Three, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will never get in the way of the Word of God. The Kundalini Spirit will always divert people from being in the Word of God. Four, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will always be praising Jesus Christ. The Kundalini Spirit will always be praising God and self. The specific praising of Jesus Christ is to differentiate the Holy Spirit from false spirits. Five, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will always adhere to order within corporate worship. The Kundalini Spirit will never adhere to any order, only experience. Six, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will always thank the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. The Kundalini Spirit will not. Seven, the baptism of the Holy Spirit will utter prophecy and scripture that will be 100% in line with the Bible. The Kundalini Spirit will not and will try to get people away from the Bible and into a doctrine that is so close, but not the real word of God. The character of the Holy Spirit, John 16, 13 through 15 says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. So the Holy Spirit is only going to reveal to you Jesus Christ. If it's anything else and you can't see Jesus doing that or saying that, it is not the Holy Spirit. There are other spirits of the enemy busy doing works of darkness along with these false guiding spirits. A lying spirit comes when people continue to want the lies of false prophets over the truth of God's prophets. And this it goes way back into the Bible, but it's very present now where I frequently have people tell me, I don't want to hear that. So and I don't claim to be of any office either, but when you tell them what the word says, they resist it, they reject it, and they call me rigid. But it's actually, this is what opens a door for a lying spirit because the people want lies. The spirit of the Antichrist is also part of this group. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist. You have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. First John 4, 3. The Antichrist spirit argues and argues and argues and argues and argues in a Bible study. They just argue. They're very time consuming. But when you try to tell the person this is a demon, they're very resistant to that. Spirit of deception, seducing spirits. There are so many in the world today and many are overtaken by spirits of deception. That's almost a 100% present spirit in prayer ministry. First Timothy 4, 1 says, the spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times shall come, some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And that's happening right now. We are definitely in the last days. We've been talking about that. It's like, I can't, I can't even believe we're watching what we're watching right now as far as markers in prophecy. It is, it's dumbfounding that we're living in this time. Jesus is coming soon. The devil is seeking to deceive all that will yield to his lies. And as I mentioned with the hypnotic preacher, many churches practice getting into a state of antichrist altered perception by chanting and singing the same verses over and over and over. Six to 10 minutes later, they're still repeating the same two lines of a song. Christian repetitions are very, are, have no difference from chanting a false religion. A mantra is a mantra. It matters very little if you use Jesus or some other false God as your centering mechanism. And Jesus warned about this in Matthew 6, 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. And counterfeit spirits will make it all about the worshipers and about their experience. That's what it's about. It's about creating the right experience. 
The Holy Spirit, however, in true worship, makes it all about Jesus Christ. All eyes, all thoughts are fixed on Jesus Christ. So if that's not happening in your worship, corporately or individually, it is not the Holy Spirit. Because if it was the Holy Spirit, you would be fixed on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to accomplish the purposes of God, not entertainment, not experiences, and not spiritual feelings. The spirit of mysticism is another spirit that's leading in many Christian churches today, not the Holy Spirit. Christians were warned that this time would come, and the Bible speaks of many who are, were practicing Christians that leave for a more exciting experience of a different seducing spirit that was more interesting and gave them a better experience. And that was like that pastor from Ohio. He was tired of not feeling God. Rather than walking in the truth and believing what the Bible says, he wanted to experience feelings. Great way to be deceived and taken out quickly. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some will depart, depart from the faith because of these doctrines of devils and were warned here about the counterfeit Holy Spirit. A thing that is counterfeit is always made to look as close as possible to the genuine article. And this lets us know that everything that is claimed to be of the Holy Spirit is probably so close to it that it's hard to tell, but we must test the spirits. And John wrote how John gave us, this is the New Testament, we are continuously told to test these spirits. The final Antichrist will produce lying wonders. Paul warned about a future Antichrist that would do exactly this. He explained that will happen in this manner. This evil man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of wicked deception to fool those who are on their way to destruction because they refuse to believe the truth that will save them. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. This person will produce counterfeit power, counterfeit signs, and he will have the power to deceive many because they do not know the truth and they welcome deception. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 gives the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and where you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory that, keep in memory what I preached to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received, how Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Our God is a God of reason and order. Proverbs 16.32 says to the undisciplined, He is slow to anger. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. God gave us a brain, common sense, and a Bible, and we need to use them. These days are so treacherous. A lie is often very subtle, wrapped up with a tiny bit of truth that makes it look legitimate. And it's very concerning when you watch some of these larger churches that are being exposed on to, on a global front and you watch the practices that are going on in these churches it's crazy that no one saw that coming it's just crazy that people felt that they were actually in a church governed by the holy spirit because there is very little indication of that in reality if your church is not focused on the word, understanding the word, 
and obeying the word in practice and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the lost and building the kingdom of heaven. And worship isn't music, it's a lifestyle. If that is not the core of your church, that is very concerning because it doesn't match the church that Jesus is coming back for. If you see a group of church people acting in a way that is contrary to what the Bible says about a church, and oftentimes what your own conscience tells you is wrong, it is wrong, and leave that church. Because at this point, we don't know that we have one more day before Jesus won't come and take away the church, the true church. But also for those of us who are the, the people that I'm around, we probably get one or two death notices a week anymore where someone we know died tragically at a young age, generally of the incredibly um, lethal drugs that are now out there, far more suicides. It is not worth it to stay in a church that is not governed by the King of Kings because you will not be able to participate in what he's really doing if you stay there. Paul wanted order in the church, not chaos. He certainly did not want people going to church for an experience. It's not a concert. He lays out in detail in 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14 how the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts and how they are to be used. And it is not up to us to decide who gets what or who gets to manufacture a brand new gift for pleasure. How many Christians in these critical times are seen as weak-minded or even crazy by the world who desperately needs to see Jesus, not crazy. We have to be very careful not to deny the genuine work of the Holy Spirit and to always be using the Word of God as our discernment. God is a supernatural God. He acts in supernatural power to reveal himself. He heals miraculously. He gives his followers power to overcome the devil and even to cast the devil out in others when they are possessed but are repentant and ready to honor Jesus. The business of God is always people and he's always about healing people. He's not about entertaining people. Paul was passionate in his defense of God's power operating in his life in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Precious Lord, you know the state of the church, and you also know that there are passionate people out here just craving revival, true, genuine revival. I ask that you would continue to sift the churches and that you would raise up shepherds who actually care for their flock in a way that matches your desires that the flock is protected from the enemy by the shepherd and i ask that you burn through churches who claim the name of jesus christ by the power of your holy spirit and burn out all the flesh all the seducing spirits, all the works of Satan that are being used in place of the amazing power of the Holy Spirit to set free, heal, and deliver. I ask for everyone who is listening 
that they would set their own house in order. We ask for that for ourselves, that you would help us to always choose holiness, choose purity, to consider that some people around us Many don't know you and will go forever into eternity lost if someone doesn't show Jesus Christ to them. So help us, Jesus, to be a bright light on the hill in these dark days and help us to be part of a great harvest for you. We desire to see you high and lifted up in our area. So come, Lord Jesus. I ask that you start with us and that you bring revival to our area. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.